Hello, and thank you for taking time to view this informational DVD. Cityscape is presenting this seminar to introduce you to your new role on the Board of Directors. This seminar will discuss your role on the Board and will also discuss some new important laws that govern homeowners associations. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to explain the process of an election to the Board and the different roles played in the election of directors and officers in a homeowners association. First, the membership votes for the directors at their annual meeting. Alternately, if a seat is vacated by a board member, the remaining board members can appoint a homeowner to fill the vacancy and the term of the outgoing position. In either case, once the board is elected or appointed by the board or the membership, the board of directors, among themselves, select the officers. The officers are generally the president, the vice president, the secretary, and the treasurer. Some associations' bylaws allow a director to hold more than one officer position. Please consult your bylaws for this information. The role of the president is to chair the meetings, to call meetings to order, to establish a quorum to make sure business can be conducted, and to keep meetings moving along according to the agenda. It is usual, but not required, that the president be the voice of the board of directors. This is to ensure that the board speaks from one voice and to avoid management from being driven in too many different directions. The president should be most familiar with Robert's Rules of Order or appropriate parliamentary procedure to ensure meetings are accurate, productive, and remain on point. The vice president generally presides over meetings when the board president is not available and is the second point of contact with management. The secretary approves meeting minutes and signs legal documents such as bank signature cards and other legal documents. The treasurer is most familiar with books and records and works closely with Cityscape's controller and accounting department to ensure accuracy in financial reporting. It is important to note that while you are now serving on the Board of Directors, you are only one of several Board members, and alone, you have no authority. But as a team member on the larger Board of Directors, your role and efforts will guide your Homeowners Association into the future. Welcome to the Board, and we hope this presentation begins to touch on the important responsibilities you now share with your fellow Directors. We at Cityscape are here to make your role on the Board a positive experience. This demonstration is basically to give uh, new board members, returning board members, an overview of um, how a board best works in our experience, how a board best works with management, and uh, then we're going to go through some of the, um, the roles that board members play individually and collectively, and then we're going to go through some of the laws that are uh, going to be relevant to your um, uh, interactions and your deliberations going forward. There's a lot of laws. We're not going to go through them all. We're going to go through the ones that we think are relevant um, for a new board member. Uh, the first misconception that we see often is that a, um, a homeowner one day runs for the board, gets elected, and that they think that their status has changed in some way. It has. You're elected to the board, but a single board member does not compromise a board, comprise a board. Um, and what we, what, we, what we see happen is that people will take particular points of interest, maybe expertise, that they have and decide that that's the focus that they want to do, but they're acting as an individual board member. Management's job is to kind of try to rein that, uh, that good um, energy in and uh, direct it inward to the rest of the board members so that when the board does speak, it's speaking as a body. Uh, that also protects each individual board member because uh, Directors and law Officers Liability Insurance protects you so long as you are listening to the advice of professionals and making good business judgments. Uh, management may not disagree, the homeowners may disagree with you, your decisions, but if you deliberate and you discuss amongst yourselves and you use good judgment, uh, you are protected with the umbrella of Directors and Officers Liability. Under the Cityscape policy, that's a $1 million policy with a $15 million umbrella. So you are protected uh, collectively to $16 million in any judgment and any defense of a claim against the board. If you are a board member going outside that and directing traffic, giving opinions as if they are board opinions, you are, you are no longer shielded and potentially you are open to litigation against you personally. And the directors and officers of liability insurance will say, that was negligent, that was not good business judgment, we will not defend it. So in your packet, we're not going to go through it, but in your packet uh, you will see what the uh, 15 most common claims against directors and officers are. That's homework for later. But what is important for new board members coming in, and we can provide all of the information to you, is 
uh, as a new owner um, at, and board member, you have the CCNRs. Um, and you signed a piece of paper that you read them, agree with them, and everything else. Uh, most people don't read them uh, until you have to look something up. But if you have a, a complete set of the rules, the bylaws, the, the um, CCNRs, um, and uh, they are also suggesting in the uh, California Association of Community Managers that such a board orientation um, include an offer to board members to go get continuing education. If there's a particular point of interest, CACM, ECHO, there's uh, CAI, they all give um, seminars and seminars are topical. And uh, we get the flyers and we can certainly forward those onto the board. Uh, most associations like their board members to be educated and would be happy to pay the $45 for the two hours, three hour seminar and lunch if you're willing to take the time off. So um, if you are interested in anything in particular, we can send you the flyers, decide if you want to join. And that's a, uh, that's a budget item. We should put that in the budget for future board member training. Um, the first 100 days uh, are the most important to formulate the board and, and, and get everybody on the same page so that you are working as a team. The board may decide at some point that three people want a new garage door, two people don't. And uh, the, board has, uh, the board has made its decision. So the board has voted, not unanimously, but the board has voted for the garage door. So not all decisions uh, necessarily have to be unanimous, but even if you're in the d dissenting view, you need to be on board with it. You, know, you need to state your case and then live with the uh, end product if, uh, if that's the case. Um, avoid making rash <coughs> decisions. Um, board members sometimes get on the board and they want a lot of things changed. That's why they got on the board. They, they got on because they want to see things ha happening fast. They want better communication. Usually one of the biggest reasons uh, that um, a new board member get on is they didn't know anything that was going on. Nobody ever told them anything. So they wanted to get on the board so they would know what's going on. Um, but uh, take your time. Be a little bit more deliberative. and. Understand a little bit of the past without having to reinvent the wheel right away. After 100 days, after a few months, you're, you'll make the right decisions. Um, so that, that's just good advice. Keep an open mind. Try not to become a one-issue board member. Um, there's a lot of things that go on at every association, and you may have a particular expertise or interest, but be interested in everything as well. Talk with your fellow members, not just board members, but, but your members, your neighbors and get a little feedback from that and bring that to the board meeting. Um, that, that's going to help you act as a body. Um, be a positive influence. Um, it's easy to say, you didn't do that right, you didn't do that right, you didn't do that right. And we all work for a living. And you know how much more fun is it to go to work when it's constructive criticism, you don't do everything right all the time, but um, you know, you're, you're a team and you're all trying for the same thing. So don't, don't, don't beat anybody up. <clears throat> and then um, in the first 100 days, the board as a group should, achieve, or should establish goals. What do you want out of this next year as you're working together? Establish five or ten. Put reasonable time limits on them. If you're going to delegate to, uh, to committees, make them, uh, don't, don't do too many committees because you're going to be overwhelmed. Uh, again, be deliberative and take, uh, take your time and take the, the most important issues first. Some of these things can wait until we get the larger issues that we face out of the way. That's just advice. It's not a rule. Um, again, in the, um, in the brochure, there's a four or five pages about directors and officers liability. And the only reason I point that out is it is management's job to keep the board out of trouble. So if we do give you advice, it is advice not because that's our opinion, it's because we think or because we're trying to protect the board from making bad decisions. You can disagree with us and you can go the other direction, but please listen to us, deliberate, and then make your decision based on you know, your best judgment. Now we're going to get into some of the, the functional pieces of operating as a board. When the board meets, unless it's for coffee and, and crumpets, and uh, if you are talking association business, no three of you may be in the same room together talking about association business without it being an open board meeting. So you can, have, you can socially meet with each other and, and have each other over for coffee. But if you're going to meet with more than three, of, uh, three members, you may not talk about association business. Okay? That's just against the rules. The Open Meeting Act allows for a quorum of the board. Anytime three of you get together, it'd be noticed. Members are invited to attend. 
not necessarily to participate. And that's, that's a big uh, difference here. The board, a board meeting is a business meeting and the members may attend the meeting and they may be given an opportunity of three minutes or five minutes to speak. The board does not have to take any action on whatever the homeowner might be asking for, or you can. Um, but uh, a board meeting where everybody's hollering from the audience and you're going back and forth, that's, that's uh, not parliamentary procedure. It's, it's actually not lawful. You're supposed to have a business meeting with an opportunity of the members before the meeting or after to, to participate by giving what they are, you know, their ideas or their uh, suggestions. Mm -hmm. But they're not in the deliberative process during the meeting. Uh, and you're a small association here. Larger associations get a little bit out of hand. When you've got 300 homeowners, you have to have an owner's forum and it has to be limited to two minutes and you have to limit that to 30 minutes. Smaller associations, you can be a little bit more neighborly. But remember, it is a board meeting is a business meeting. Executive sessions are allowed where you meet outside the membership and specifically you are required to meet outside of the members. You may not discuss items uh, in front of the members that include litigation, matters relating to the formation of contracts with third parties. That could be a janitorial contract, it can be a management contract. If you are going to be contracting with anyone and you are deliberating about the details of the contract, that must be an executive session. Uh, member discipline. Somebody's having a party, their dogs are out of control, they've got blue drapes facing the outside. Um, you may meet in executive session to discuss this um, and you may call that homeowner, homeowner to an, a hearing and that can be an executive session. And uh, you want to meet with an owner regarding collection of assessments. You don't want to sit at a board meeting and say, Unit 402 hasn't paid in six months. You just don't do that. Um, there are fair debt collection laws um, and privacy laws that govern how you communicate to your members that you have a, a somebody in delinquency, somebody in collections, maybe even somebody in foreclosure. Um, and that is by lot and block number. You may identify that somebody's in collections by lot and block, but not by name, not by unit number. Our job to, to make sure, please. Um, that's true, even um, the lot and block number are um, just uh, online for the San Francisco um, assessor's website. You could find out uh, what unit it is with lot and block number. Exactly, if somebody wanted to do that homework, they could. Yeah, it is, uh, the corporate record is not going to identify, the corporate record being the minutes is not going to identify the owner by unit na name or unit number. Can I ask one other question? Please. I'm, I'm going back a little bit. When you were talking about if there are three of us, you cannot meet and talk about the association, and yet you just said that you can talk about the association in a, a, an executive meeting. Well, that could be three people. Correct. So There's only four issues you may talk about in a group of three or more, and those items are litigation, personnel, I didn't get to personnel, that was it, um, and uh, either member discipline or uh, somebody that so isn't paying. Those, four, a, those four items you may meet, in fact, you must meet outside the group, and it must be a quorum of the board. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, good question. Um, the law is not uh, keeping pace with technology, but it's trying. And uh, now uh, the board can meet, and uh, at some future point when we are enabled, uh, the members may meet so long as everybody is on the same page at the same time, meaning uh, webcam, teleconference, um, the board can meet. If somebody is traveling, they can call in. I think we even had a meeting uh, recently where we put the cell phone in the middle of the room and uh, by speakerphone we had a quorum. Uh, so we can do uh, meetings when uh, busy people travel, uh, we can still have the meeting without having to have a quorum of the board in the room at the same time. Uh, one of the more practical and mundane things that the board has to deal with, management deals with every day, is when something goes wrong to a unit, whose responsibility is it? Is it the homeowners association or is it the individual homeowner? And there's a diagram in here, it's a very simple one that shows a toilet. And a toilet is a fixture, as a dishwasher is a fixture, as a faucet is a fixture. At what point uh, in the plumbing line or the electrical line, usually utility, does the homeowner's responsibility stop and the associations start? The untechnical term 
is the association um, owns uh, everything up to and including the unfinished surface of the interior of the unit. So if we use this room right here as a, um, as a template, and this was my unit, I would own the paint. I would own the carpet. The carpet is a finished surface. However, the sheetrock that the paint is applied to is the homeowners association. So I own the paint and the airspace within. That's a non-technical insurance um, differential there. Uh, so when we send out somebody to do a repair at a building, uh, if somebody calls us up at 11 o'clock at night and says, my toilet's overflowing, we don't ask, we don't have a diagram in our, in our emergency dispatch that says, well, tell me, ma'am, uh, is it leaking from you know, this point or this point? We send the plumber. When we send the plumber, the plumber knows this is a homeowner's association and not an apartment building. In an apartment building, the owner pays whatever, unless it was negligence. In a condo association, the plumber has to dif differentiate on his invoice where the failure lies. And generally speaking, the angle stop that turns off the toilet belongs to the owner. The pipe that supplies the water to the angle stop belongs to the association. So there are times when we have to find out on which side of the angle stop uh, did it fail. The plumbers that we send out in emergency situations take the part with them and replace it. So we always have that part. If there's ever a question of where the failure occurred, we have the part. We've got more parts. We can open up a used plumbing store, usually plumbing. Um, so when an emergency occurs uh, and somebody calls our emergency line, if we consider it an emergency, we will dispatch the vendor. The association will pay the vendor. We will then find out from the invoice, was this an owner's responsibility or is an association responsibility. If it's an owner's responsibility, we have already paid the plumber. We are now going to put a reimbursement assessment on the owner. So the plumber's not waiting you know, for, for six months while we dispute it with the owner. So there are times when you look at your financials that you will see we paid a bill on behalf of an owner because we picked up the phone and called that plumber. Um, and th those are practical and, and mundane and very common occurrences where, where the board is going to have to make a judgment call uh, and that's when you pull out your CCNRs and your insurance policy and you make the judgment call. And, and the reason why um, you pay, and one of the reasons why you pay the plumber up front, uh, or I wouldn't say up front, but um, for the association and before um, the, the payment dispute occurs is because a plumber can lean the building for, for payment and that could uh, prevent owners from selling their Correct. He can lean, a plumber could lean the entire building. Yeah. yeah. And we've had that kind of stuff happen before, so it is our policy. I'm not sure all other management companies, I think it's pretty universal, that if the management company is making the phone call that gets the plumber out of bed, the association pays for that, and it's our job then to chase that down, that individual owner down. That's a very common occurrence. We deal with it every day. Um, back before this year, it used to be that you would uh, publish a collection policy and that published collection policy became our directive. So when a homeowner didn't pay their dues after the first 15 days, we would send them a friendly reminder with a late charge. When the second month came along, we would send them, and they didn't pay in the first 15 days, we would send them a second late charge and a, a delinquency notice that was a little more serious. I'm trying to get your attention here, where are you? This is getting serious. On the third month of the delinquency, we send a 10-day notice out that if you don't pay in full in 10 days, it'll be turned over to collection without further notice. And that was all easy. We could handle that pretty easily internally. The new law requires that the board meet and confirm or reaffirm its already established policy. I don't make the rules. <laughs> so when we do have to turn someone over to collection, we are going to have to have a meeting openly noticed. Members can attend. It can be one topic if we have nothing else to talk about. And the board has to approve turning that unit over to collection without using its name or unit number. So it can be a two-minute meeting saying that the board approves lot, block, number to be turned over to collection, meeting adjourned. Uh, it's, it's to protect the, the few times that uh, people get their homes taken away outrageously, they didn't know, they didn't get the notice, et cetera, et cetera. 
So um, it's just another layer. Uh, also, if uh, we do file a lien after the board approves it and then uh, they still don't pay, a foreclosure notice goes out, they still don't pay, they don't ask for a payment plan, the uh, trustee will say, uh, do you want us to, con uh, to foreclose uh, and have a trustee sale? The board has to meet again and approve that. So there's going to be two opportunities for the board. In the city of San Francisco, in my 25 years, I have only seen one foreclosure on that courthouse steps. I'm sure there's been many more. But because real estate values are so high in San Francisco, um, somebody, somebody pays off before it gets to the courthouse steps. Uh, we have another one at, um, at another property right now. This will be the second one. It's, it's just not a common occurrence. Even during the dot-com bust, uh, we didn't see foreclosures. We saw them go into collections. We saw refinances. We saw people sell their units at a loss. But we just didn't see a lot of foreclosures. Uh, there are, in the, in the booklet there, there are timelines. Uh, associations get frustrated sometimes because the money that we haven't collected, especially if it's a large special assessment or something, we need that money to operate. And um, the due process that the state of California allows, it takes nine to 10 months from the first delinquency to the sale of the courthouse steps. You're accruing late charges, you're accruing interest, you will collect, you will get your money at the end of the day. There's a rare bankruptcy. Uh, there's a bankruptcy with some rare circumstances that the association is out. But so long as we are um, in line with our lien, uh, then, then the association generally uh, gets 100% of what is due. And by the way, you are welcome to ask questions. I know you just stepped in here, so um, feel free. Thank you, Kevin Wiley. Hi, Ed. Park West. We can edit that out. Uh, here's another very, very onerous new law that is driving management companies batty, and that is a member's right to inspect and copy records. It used to be that a homeowner got a copy of the budget and the bylaws and the CCNRs and the minutes and there were you know, certain things that they could see and if they lost their copy we would reproduce for them and it just wasn't a hassle at all. Now the law is that a member um, upon request can look at just about everything which includes canceled checks, bank statements,